I'm really excited to be here, um, kind of two years later. Um, <clears throat> working with Bontech with Washington was amazing, so thank you, Mark, for having this conference. It's been pretty incredible um, to talk to all these folks. When we first had our call about this session, um, I knew it was going to be great. We have policy, law, research, and we've kind of heard a few times throughout these sessions that it's a little too early to tell, but we do have a lot of great indicators, and this is probably the best panel to give us some insight into what's going on in both Colorado and Washington. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, we're going to start with Pete from Washington, and we're going to kind of move east to Colorado. Are the microphones necessary? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, thank you, Jill. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm Pete Holmes. I, I am the uh, city attorney from Seattle, Washington. I wanted to point out that uh, it's usually considered the state of Seattle and the state of Washington, but if you want to say that I'm from the state of Washington, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll embrace that. I see we have some of the uh, Liquor and Cannabis Board members here, too, so I'm going to be on best behavior. <laughs> Um, you know, I attended a number of the sessions here, and I wanted to uh, pause for a second. I've heard the term inevitability so much that I wanted, uh, before we talk about prospects and outcomes, just to remind you, just go back and down memory lane all of three and a half years ago. Colorado may have been a little different. We were genuinely, we were optimistic in Washington State, uh, but by no means did we consider it inevitable that legalization was going to happen. And moreover, we were thinking that even if it did, how did we answer the questions like, what about the feds? And uh, believe me, there were certainly a lot of otherwise progressive leaders in the state of Washington and in the city of Seattle that were by no means, shape, or form totally committed and, and convinced that this is the way we were going to go. And in fact, uh, there had been many failed efforts in the state of Washington before uh, 502 made it to the ballot and succeeded. There were different theories about how to go about it. So um, I was uh, elected, I'm the only elected city attorney uh, in the state of Washington. Uh, I was elected in 2009 primarily because I was very interested in police reform. And so when you think about the city of Seattle, you also can't talk about marijuana reform without talking about the fact that we're now under the federal consent decree to reform our police department. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the state of Washington. Um, when I took office in uh, 2010, and I got to say my deputy city attorney is here, he, uh, this may invoke PTSD in him from that first term, but um, I uh, had promised that, among other things, that uh, I was not going to prosecute marijuana possession cases anymore. So uh, on the first day of office, we dismissed all the pending cases, never filed another one. But I say that just to remind you that uh, the response, which was, not entirely unanticipated was by the police departments then proceeding to triple the number of arrests in 2010. So it was uh, an example of how um, you, know, you can try to advance policy and yet if you don't have buy-in across the board, um, you're, you're going to find that you're, you can find your best efforts undermined. Same is true for 502. So um, when uh, the, the predicates too leading up finally to 502 were uh, after stopping the prosecution of the Seattle Municipal Court, uh, jailings uh, dropped. Uh, we were able to talk about you know, real valid public safety threats and how to reorient the uh, police department. It was actually a pretty healthy discussion. Um, so in 2011, we actually succeeded in getting a bipartisan legislature to overhaul our uh, medical marijuana system, which had been passed by initiative two years after California in 1998. So it's going to be the first significant overhaul. We got that through a bipartisan legislature with a supermajority, by the way, not that it was needed, but with quite a majority, only to have a progressive governor eviscerated with line item vetoes, just made the law worse than it was before. And that's when a lot of us said, screw it, it's time to legalize. Uh, so I kind of give credit to the uh, former governor uh, in the state of Washington for helping us to finally say it's time. And, uh, and that's how 502 was born. So um, again, just want to say that the inevitability, uh, I feel some pressure here. Uh, I do hope, I think that we are going the right way. There's a lot of unanswered questions and that's what the focus today is going to be about. Uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, that uh, I forget which speaker said that you know all eyes are on Colorado and Washington. That's one of the reasons that it might not be inevitable if we blow it. Uh, 
it's going to be an, a lesson for the rest of the country, you know. And in fact, we do learn from each other's mistakes or oversights, or whatever. And we're continuing to make uh, fine-tuned adjustments and, and corrections, course corrections here and there. Um, but uh, each state is, is different. You're going to get tired of hearing that. Um, our our unique circumstances having to do with the way medical marijuana was really uh, completely, essentially unregulated. Uh, and it meant that 502 had to come to, to the ballot uh, with, a, with a clear um, marker that in no way would it modify the existing medical marijuana law, whatever it was. It was extremely confusing and, and, uh, and basically it was wild wild west with medical marijuana. It took our legislature two years to finally reconcile the two. We left that to the legislature and uh, they finally did that uh, in uh, the 2015 session, and um, it means that by July 1 of this year, every medical uh, and recreational sale of marijuana has to be done pursuant to a state license. And that's something that I've been very strong behind. I believe in state regulation, state licensing. But the, the challenge now going forward is, is kind of uh, reduced to uh, the, the real uh, detail work now that's required as we try to settle into what does a mature marijuana system look like, how are we going to uh, make sure that we deliver on the promise to the voters that it's not just legalization, but it's legalization plus regulation and taxation. And uh, you actually, absent regulation, are not going to be able to deliver on taxation. And, and moreover, um, there are those eight predicate goals, if you recall. They take the Ogden and the Cole memos together that have allowed Colorado and Washington to move forward. Uh, those were articulated in August of 2013, so we're still not even three years to that. I, uh, I met last week with the U.S. Attorney in the Western District of Washington, and uh, she made it clear that uh, the U.S. Attorneys in, the, in our states are being pressured uh, there's the Haida report, the GAO uh, has challenged uh, the Department of Justice. How are you monitoring those eight uh, guidelines that you set out, youth access, impaired driving, those kinds of things? Leakage, uh, how are you monitoring those kinds of things? And uh, I think that, uh, in truth, the, um, the U.S. attorneys are, are pretty nervous about what that report's going to look like. And uh, in my own state, I, I worry about uh, going forward, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about this, uh, how we're going to deal with the questions of pesticides, how are we going to deal with delivery services, uh, how are we going to uh, actually police the licensees, you know, the guys that are out there competing in the marketplace, um, and they're doing so in an uh, immature, uh, uncertain market. Uh, they've, they've got lots of challenges to make payroll. Uh, and yet, we also have to make sure, while they're operating on a level playing field, that they are sticking with the rules. And so, um, I don't know how close I am to the, uh, the opening time here. I want to make sure we leave, we leave, we leave some time for, for questions, but that's kind of my big, broad view. And, and what, I, what I want to point out is that uh, in my, my, for my personal role in all of this, this is one of the things that I pursue is to make sure that um, it's not just a public vote and it's not just the legislature. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, it's really incumbent on prosecutors to step in and uh, take stands like this. Um, when, uh, when in 502, uh, it, it's one of those discussions that I think that the public really is ready for. If you talk about prosecutorial discretion, that's where you can actually start to have the beginnings of really, uh, I think, probing more than just philosophical questions about what is the role of government and how do we lose our way with the best of intentions, worrying about youth access, worrying about um, drug abuse and, and other problems like that. Uh, it is the prosecutors who need to speak up more and say, in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in our system, it's time that we recognize that applying the criminal hammer to what is uh, a public health issue, primarily, um, is the wrong course. And I think that the more, the more prosecutors do that, but the, but the challenge is after the applause is over, uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do instead? 
and and there is it's 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 relatively easy to have the conviction that you know prosecutors need to speak up and be the source of change, but at the same time we're right now in that phase where the sleeves are rolled up and uh, we're really getting down to the brass tacks. There are lots of details that need to be worked out, including the exercise of criminal uh, sanctions when necessary to bolster the regulatory system. So uh, I kind of leave it at that for now and then come back to uh, questions that the audience might have. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Andrew Friedman. I'm Colorado's Director of Marijuana Coordination. Uh, I tell a lot of groups uh, I was the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff before this. My mom was really proud and went all to tall for parties and told everybody that her son was the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff. Uh, and now that I'm Colorado's first marijuana czar, she tells everybody that I'm the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, it's, it's nice to talk to a friendly audience. Um, so um, um, I, I'm just going to briefly explain how Colorado got to the point where it is, because uh, I think um, history is still playing on, uh, you know, history from 2000 is still playing on our current system in pretty significant ways. We started off with Amendment 20 in Colorado, and by, every, by the way, everything passed in Colorado was a constitutional amendment passed by the people. Um, we've since gone back, back and cleared up the code a little bit and made some other things legal, like uh, the recreation or the licensed medical market, but really the foundation blocks for legalized marijuana in Colorado or written straight into our constitution. So Amendment 20 passed uh, in 2000, and that was you can go to your doctor, you can get a recommended plant count, you can either grow it yourself or you can give it to a caregiver who supposedly for no profit is growing it for you. And that existed in a, a fairly cottage industry for nine years all by itself. Um, you guys are all familiar with the different federal memos that came out, but in 2009 after the Ogden memo, uh, the state of Colorado said ah, we should probably get into this game a little bit more and we wrote the, uh, the code for retail medical marijuana. Uh, the voters liked that so much that in 2012 they voted for uh, recreational marijuana uh, that had both uh, home growth, six plants, but also uh, provided for a recreational market, licensed market. We spent the next year writing those rules and that went into effect uh, January 1st of 2014. Um, and so we have all those systems still today. Those, those all exist, and I think that's an important thing to remember, uh, that none of these things kind of exist in a, in a vacuum anymore. So, um, you know, the good news is that it's been a relatively stable rollout. Um, and so, uh, you know, it kind of depends on which audiences you're talking to about what, what that means. But I would say the, the fears of a, a lot of people of, everything's going to change in Colorado have not been realized. That in general what you see in Colorado looks fairly similar to what you see in 2009, 2008, uh, going back for a long time. There's a lot of reasons for that, but if you thought that this meant that literally every kid in school was stoned, then you're living on, you're just not living in reality. And so the good news is that, you know, questions that we had at the beginning that our governor certainly had of, is there actually going to be a highly regulated recreational market? Is it possible to get these things off the ground? I mean, from a Department of Revenue standpoint, from, uh, from a criminal justice standpoint, from all of these different public health, Department of Agriculture, a lot of people really did have to come together to make this work, uh, and that happened. So that, that's what I call the marijuana miracle, uh, is um, you know, in a, in a time where everybody's pretty skeptical about government, uh, they actually did come together in a fairly agenda-free way to get a lot of technical work uh, to happen and, and get it off the ground. Um, from my point of view, it was an unbelievable heroic effort by a lot of people who frankly voted against Amendment 64 in a lot of cases, uh, but also didn't think that this was the job they were signing up for. So I will say that's the good news. Also on the industry side, you see a fairly high compliance rate. Um, you know, we do underage stings, we come in with our, our marijuana enforcement division and check up on thousands of rules, of, uh, thousands of lines of regulation. We see generally they're doing it the same or better than the liquor stores, which uh, I think is, again, good news and generally in line with the vision of what the voters passed for passed when they, they passed Amendment 64. I think when you walk into a recreational store, it looks about how people envisioned it to look. Uh, it's, a, it's a safe and healthy experience, and so that's all what I would say is, is pretty good news. Um, it hasn't been without the regulatory challenges at the beginning. Um, it's worth 
pausing on for a little bit. Edibles was obviously a regulatory challenge for us. Um, you know, the opening months of legalization, we had deaths related to edible uh, ingestion. Um, we had to gather everybody for uh, for emergency rulemaking session. Uh, I would say we see generally three problems with edibles, three challenges. The first is uh, overdosing, um, and that is, hey, there's a lot of marijuana naive people who are they're, the way that they're trying marijuana again after a long time, or maybe for the first time, uh, looks better through a gummy bear than it does through some strange apparatus that they don't know what to deal with. Uh, so they're buying edibles, or another point that John Hudak from the Brookings Institute pointed out was a lot of these people don't have places to smoke, and so they are using edibles uh, as a way of trying marijuana. Uh, and so uh, they are, I mean, I think everybody knows this experience. You have one edible, you wait about 30 minutes, you're sure it's a dud, you have a second edible, and then maybe you have a third, and suddenly, two to three hours later, you're just having an incredibly horrible experience. Uh, and so we found that to be a problem. We have a public education campaign. I actually think Maureen Dowd did more for helping people become aware of this. Everybody was so mad at her for, for doing this. I was like, that's a $10 million campaign for us. That was the best thing that ever happened. Um, and, and it was a campaign to out of state tourists, which again, that's kind of where that education needed to happen. And so I was happy that she wrote that and I, I thanked her for it. Um, we're glad she did it in Denver, not so long. <laughs> <laughs> it was my second week on the job, and Maureen Dowd called me and told me she overdosed on an edible, and I'm like, this is a weird job. <laughs> so the, the second problem that we, we saw, and, and kids were showing up into the emergency rooms, were uh, accidental ingestion by kids. Uh, we borrowed everything we could from uh, from uh, the uh, medical, uh, from prescription drugs, you know, it should leave the manufacturer in childhood receivable packaging. Let's have a public education campaign about keeping it locked and stored away from kids. Um, you know, the other interesting part of that has become actually maids in hotel rooms. Uh, that uh, marijuana left by tourists in hotel rooms, probably after they had an overdose problem, uh, is often eaten by the people who then clean up the room, which is unfortunately a lot of the way some of these people get by. And so these are non-native speakers, uh, uh, non-English speakers. Um, they often are transient populations, so they're hard to get education to. So one of the things we said we have to do is individually stamp edibles with, with, with universal symbols. So starting in October, you'll see caution signs on every single edible, uh, just like you'll see every single prescription drug or over-the-counter drug stamped with something. Uh, I think it was an important move for us. And the third one is, um, you know, what sort of message are we sending to kids when there's the same thing as kids' candy is showing up in, uh, in, the, the, uh, uh, in the retail stores? Is this the same as candied cigarettes from the 1960s and 1970s? Are we needlessly desensitizing kids towards marijuana? The answer is obviously yes. Um, and uh, we, the problem is what legal mechanism we use in Colorado in order to say what is an adult-looking candy versus a kid's-looking candy, which in some ways is a silly distinction. We started with, we're trying to run a bill through legislature right now that says it can't look like a person, it can't look like an animal, it can't look like a fruit, and um, a message to industry that, and then we're gonna go around and look at stuff, and if we can e make easier distinctions on which should be banned, we're gonna ban those things as well. Uh, and so, you should get wise and start making them look more like a diet of chocolates than Hershey's bars, uh, and then that way, we won't have to add to the banned list. Um, banking uh, is obviously uh, a problem all by itself. We could spend all the time talking about banking. It's one of the things that the governor cares about most in Colorado, I think for a couple of reasons. One, we're trying so hard for a legitimate industry, and we've just denied one of the, the normal regulatory tools we have. And so uh, I think uh, we feel like a way of quickly legitimizing industries, making them keep clean books. When you deal in all cash, you don't have to keep, keep clean books, and we really worry what kind of element that brings into the system. The second is obviously a public safety issue. It's just everybody knows now there's a lot of cash, and also, by the way, a lot of marijuana in these stores, and so uh, you're opening it up to the sort of crime that you see at convenience stores. Um, I actually thought the problem would be much worse by now than it's been, um, so I've been a little surprised. Uh, we have along the way, we try our edit every Hail Mary pass we can on this one. We try to stay chartered credit union. We, we invented over the course of four days a new type of financial institution called a co-op. All these things have been shut down by the Federal Reserve, um, but, uh, but we have had luck getting current credit unions and, and community banks to, to pick up some of the banking. So the only pun that I allow myself is it's not an unbanked 
industry. It's an underbanked industry, and some might say it's a half-banked industry. <laughs> Normally, it's around, so that's all right. Um, uh, third thing is pesticides. Again, we could spend the entire day talking about pesticides. Pesticides is incredibly complicated. Normally involves the federal government both in creating the standards and enforcing pesticide use. We've had to in-house that entire thing, which has led to a lot of problems. Uh, it's probably even harder because we brought it on a little later than we did everything else, and I think that there's a lot of people who bought expensive real estate that they need to get a lot of production out of in order to grow, particularly in Denver. And, uh, and so they don't know how to grow without these pesticides at this point, and they might not have business models that work. Uh, and so pesticides will continue to be a problem uh, and continue to be a source of frustration between government and industry. Um, what I'll mention really quickly is tax revenue. Uh, you know, we got roughly $100 million last year from, from tax revenue on this. I would tell you the tax revenue doesn't matter much to the governor, and it doesn't matter much to the administration. What I'll say is it's not trivial, but I think it has outsized, outsized importance to the public who thinks that we can pave roads, pay teachers, or poor pay for healthcare costs. Um, it's a $27 billion budget in Colorado. Out of the 100 million, roughly 30% uh, goes back towards regulating the industry. Uh, and so you're left with around 70 million. That is not trivial money. It's just not a reason to go to an endeavor like this before, again. Uh, and then finally, our biggest problem is the unlicensed market in Colorado. Uh, for the rollout, the thing that's really handicapped us is the caregiver system and the home growth system that exists in the Constitution right now that we can't get a handle on. We have no idea how big it is. And it's mixed with an economic incentive to go grow inside Colorado and ship out of state. And so we have very clear evidence that, that cartels are moving into Colorado using this as a front to grow for the rest of the country. Uh, it's, again, it's more of an Amendment 20 problem than an Amendment 64 problem, uh, but it is, um, uh, it is gonna be devastating because I think it's really hard to start a legitimate licensed system when you didn't shut down Al Capone and you have the unlicensed system right next to it, uh, and it's just growing bigger and not smaller. And then, you know, there's one thing for supplying marijuana for the rest of the state or the rest of the country, but the other thing you're doing is providing seed money for organized crime to start into other activities, credit card skimming, human trafficking, really horrible stuff. And so uh, I will be on a personal crusade about what we do to understand what, how big the unlicensed market is and what we can possibly do, perhaps even going back to the Constitution, to, to take that away. And then finally, uh, there, we're going to get a lot more data from Adam over here, but um, in 19 minutes, uh, the state of Colorado is producing its first uh, marijuana data report um, that will cover everything public safety, public health, and youth prevention related. I'm very proud of the report because I think it's one of the first agenda-free reports you'll see from, from government. Uh, we gathered every person who's going to be a subject of the report ahead of time and said, here's the data sources we're going to be using, um, what are the weaknesses that you see in it, and then we're not going to consult with you again. This is that we're just going to put together an analysis of that data source. So I think it'll be a huge benefit to everybody else. We're going to put all the Excel files that we used in order to, all the data we used into an Excel file, file that will be publicly available so that you can check the data yourself and sparse it however you want to sparse it. Um, uh, and so I think that that will be a, a really big benefit. My, my, my quick and dirty on it is, I'm sorry, but it's too early. Um, and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why it's too early. One, data takes a while to come in. That that's how data works. Two, the systems really haven't been running for all that long. Um, as Professor Kleiman points out a number of times, the price of recreational just dropped to the kind of price points where it's actually competitive with medical marijuana inside the licensed systems. And so you're only now seeing people who would otherwise be medical marijuana people anyway moving into the recreational system. We're not even really at that sort of parity yet. So that's stuff that's going to take longer to get to. Uh, public health delay, you don't, people don't change overnight because um, something became legal or not legal. These are five, ten year delays of whether or not the person will now move to prescription drugs or move off prescription drugs or any sort of correlation or causation you might see. Um, <clears throat> that being said, you know, it's relatively good news in the report, I think. It shows that, uh, that Colorado was on mostly the same trends they were on before. Uh, and um, you don't see the sort of dire spikes that I think you would expect to see. Um, 
I also think it's kind of good news on DUIDs as well. Uh, I think if you look into it, it's a much more complicated story than what's being reported right now, and that we aren't sure if we have a DUID problem or not, which I think is a better story than the world is falling apart. Um, arrest rates, again, too, 80% down in filings, which is, that's, that's good news. That's people who might have a filing against them, might then get a bench warrant, might then eventually uh, show up in jail. And so when you bring down the, the percent of filings by 8,000, that's good news. On the other side, we're still, the, the filings that are being made are being made towards African American community at a higher rate than everybody else, and actually at a higher rate even than pre-legalization. So that's not great. It's great that the raw numbers are dropping. It's not great the way it's being enforced. Um, and then the only thing causation-wise that you'll be able to gather from it is people are showing up in the hospital in the ER because of edibles. Since it's just it's it's true. Um, with that, I I, I, uh, I would say you know we have not seen the effects of commercialization yet. There's a lot of machinations still in place. Um, but that's the quick and dirty snapshot of, I think, what you see today in Colorado. So I'm going to pass it over to Adam. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> as an economist, I need, I need, as Andrew pointed out, my crutch here of the slides. <laughs> uh, sitting next to two lawyers, they, they, don't, they don't have Excel on their computers, probably, or you can <laughs> pull that out. Uh, so uh, my name is Adam Lawrence uh, from the Marijuana Policy Group. Uh, that myself and uh, Miles Light, a member of uh, C Boulder Research Faculty, who started this firm while we were doing uh, the first uh, market size and demand study for the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division. Data that they track. Uh, there's an amazing amount of market information that is fascinating that we get to analyze and then help the Marijuana Enforcement Division adjust their policies accordingly. As this will continue, as, as my co-panelists have mentioned, this is continuing to evolve. And I'm not going to show you any data that really points to a conclusion because, as Andrew mentioned, it's still too early. Um, but, you know, I will be showing you some of the... Uh, um, some pieces of data that are on uh, um, prevalence. Uh, we're going to talk about demand. We're going to talk a little bit about product mix um, that we're seeing. We, we have uh, information from 2014 and 15, so we'll be looking at how things are moving around, um, a little on pricing. Um, uh, something that I'm very excited about, we've uh, built what I think is uh, the first economic impact model that looks at the linkages between uh, the marijuana industry and other industries in Colorado and computes the indirect and induced economic impacts that come along with the, direct, the numbers you see in the press, which was a billion dollars of sales, but there's actually more economic activity associated with that. And we have some preliminary estimates on some full-time jobs uh, and related jobs, like, like our jobs are, are counted in that as well. Um, so, um, one of the things, and, and um, all of this is going to point towards some bundles of outcomes that I, the way I like to think of outcomes is there's a, a bundle of outcomes that come with prohibition and there are a bundle of outcomes that come with legalization in the style that Colorado and Washington did it. Um, and you're really comparing these two bundles and you see things move their positive and negative effects of each. One of the effects is when you make a product easily accessible and uh, more safe, uh, and it's also growing in potency, you are seeing increases in user prevalence. So past month prevalence, this is a comparison of Colorado uh, on the top line and the US as a whole on the bottom. These are in 18, or over 18 who've consumed marijuana in the past month. Um, and uh, as you see, uh, legalization, uh, uh, happened in 2012. We voted for Amendment 64, and we're seeing uh, a departure from, uh, or we're seeing a faster growth than we've seen before. But this is not a surprise. This is just what happens when consumers can buy a product at a store versus uh, having to spend more effort obtaining it. Um, and uh, we're also seeing. Uh, um, increases in demand. Uh, now there's a lot going on in this chart, but uh, we calculated demand uh, in the first year to be 130 metric tons. And this is just flower equivalents, you can think of this as. Um, and uh, the, the colors, the gradations they represent, um, 
the user groups. And so when you see the large portion on the bottom, and it's something that, you know, I, I know both percent of the uh, user population, the heaviest 20% is responsible to somewhere around 70 or 80% of demand. Um, but what we're seeing over time is some uh, uh, thickening of the bands in casual users. Um, and these are, you know, these are the people that are now, since this is legal, I mean, I think a lot of people, just because it was illegal, uh, and they decided they had too much to lose, they wouldn't buy this product. But now you're seeing an increase in casual use as well. Um, but, you know, all of this, I, I couldn't think is, is a surprise. It wasn't to me. Um, another thing up there, we, we have an estimate of tourism demand. Now, this is probably one of the shakier estimates that we have. It's very hard to get at this information a lot of product on this flower equivalent basis when compared to somebody that lives in Colorado and smoking every day or consuming every day. Um, so, you know, tourism is always a story that we get, and, and it'll be a declining phenomenon if more states legalize, but it's, uh, it, to me, it's not very important. Now, lo in localized places, it is very important where tourism is very important in every sector of the economy. So that's, that's the story in on demand uh, right now. Uh, I think part of the legend was missing. Can you just tell us oh. the dark? Yeah, the black. Oh, the black is, uh, oh, oh, excuse yeah. me, the black is uh, daily, year daily. That's like 26 to 30 days a month. That is your largest cohort. Those are your everyday consumers. And then it goes goes up the chart in uh, uh, increments of five. <laughs> so, excuse me, part of the slide. A um, more sensible system of how to do, I think, uh, marijuana, at least from an operability standpoint. I mean, the difference between medical and, and recreational in Colorado is sometimes as simple as like a line of duct tape down the floor and one side is medical and the other side is recreational. And it's just a, it's not an efficient way to run a business. I mean, I'm sure business owners are, they have to have two separate inventory. It's just, it, as an economist, it just reeks of inefficiency. But, uh, you know, the question with medical and adult use to me was, you know, what's going to happen to the medical market? Uh, are the users going to be uh, is it going to dry up overnight? Is it going to go away? But it, it's persisted, and I, and I think because of the way Colorado does its regulations, because of the way prices are, it will continue to persist. I think of it like if you are uh, a medical user, you are almost always a heavy user. There are a lot of heavy users in, in that have medical, and it's like buying a Costco membership versus going to 7-Eleven, which is the, how I think of the recreational market. It's more convenient, it's easy, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how I think of it. But, um, you know, and we've seen some declines in, in, over, in, in the medical market, but it's still persisting more recreational in Colorado, and the lower line is medical. Um, and this is per gram, and uh, medical shows a lot lower, but that's because when medical users are buying, you know, ounces at a time, so on a per gram level, it's going to be still a gap there. But you're seeing prices come down uh, quite a bit, uh, from about 15 bucks a gram down to about 10, uh, and we're seeing parity across the states, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, something that tells me that, you know, that from a, a when you think about the point of the regulations to start, it was the, the lowering price to me says that, that on an economic basis, the system is working. Prices are coming down closer to the, the cost of production. You're not paying risk premiums like you would be paying with illegal purchases. Um, and seeing the prices come down also help with diversionary problems. It helps with black market issues. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's good news. Um, I have two slides now on the product mix. What is what is selling? This is medical. So we see uh, about uh, three quarters of the market still in flour in uh, in the medical market. Um, but uh, something that maybe we can also talk about in a public health and safety <coughs> discussion is concentrates. The demand for concentrated THC is rising, and it's the fastest rising part of the market. Um, and that uh, has some public health uh, repercussions, I believe, some we don't fully understand, uh, but then there's also the public health uh, implications of uh, unprofessional. I think it's, uh, it's a phenomenon that we don't fully understand, and it's something that we really 
uh, starting to get our arms around, but it is the fastest growing segment in the market. Um, in recreational, um, the difference that we see is there are a lot more concentrated edible products than we would have, we would have expected. Um, but again, even in recreational, you see the fast growth in those concentrates. And those are the concentrates that are sold um, uh, for, uh, they call it dabbing, for uh, uh, use uh, um, with, a, with a lighter torch and smoke, not the vaporization that's uh, in the infused, not an edible category. These are categories that the state uses. Um, and those are also topicals in there. But edibles are a larger part of the market and concentrates. Concentrates are growing fast. Um, here is some preliminary numbers on our economic impact model. Um, we uh, are calculating uh, a very high multiplier in the cannabis industry in Colorado, and that's uh, really the product of the regulatory structure. Um, so in economic research, you know, when we have a multiplier study, an economic impact study, where you calculate the ancillary impacts along with the direct impact. So a dollar spent at a, at a dispensary uh, is then taken maybe and sourced to intermediate products. It's also used to pay salaries. Uh, those people buy groceries. These are the kind of multiplier studies that I'm talking about. But cannabis has one of the highest multipliers in Colorado compared to other industries because the regulations force basically all of the supply chain to be within the state of Colorado. Also, all of the ownership at present is required to be in the state of Colorado. There's you know, no publicly traded companies. There's just no leakage in this industry right now. Uh, and the same would go for Washington State and any state that's doing it to start until there's interstate commerce allowed. And then this will act like other industries and won't have that high multiplier. Um, but right now, we're also calculating about 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Um, and this also is a preliminary figure. Um, and uh, we're working on shoring it up. But um, right now, the only other number we could find out there was the number of badges that the uh, MED, the Maryland Law Enforcement Division, uh, uh, issues to all of the uh, employees. Um, and that was somewhere around 22,000. So, you know, we're talking full time equivalent. We're trying to reconcile these numbers and work on it. But we, we think uh, probably somewhere in between 10 and 20,000 uh, jobs is where it's going to end up. Um, uh, Andrew was talking a little bit about the unregulated market versus the regulated market. Um, and what this slide shows is our estimate on how much of the demand is being served by the regulated market versus the unregulated market. And that unregulated market it includes both the gray, as we call it, and the black market. All those caregivers that Andrew was mentioning before. Home grow uh, is, is, is in there as well, and black market, uh, those, the cartels or the actors that kind of hide among the legal uh, and export product. Um, they're, they're, I don't know how pervasive it is, but they're there and, and they're in the news from time to time. But, so what we're seeing here is from the first year we had about 60% we felt of, of marijuana demand in Colorado um, is uh, uh, participating in the regulated market. Now we're seeing that increase to about 70% of the regulated market um, is uh, participating, or 70% of demand is participating in the regulated market. And so that also is good news um, for product safety for all the reasons that uh, were mentioned before. So, sorry, yeah. on, that oh, unregulated, on that unregulated market, <clears throat> it's very likely that 27.6 is just what's being supplied to people in Colorado. So if there's out-of-state diversion for which it's being grown for, that unregulated market could be much bigger, bigger than that 27. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. It's not. This is not a count of plants, <laughs> so to speak. You know, we're trying to do that. Right. right. Um, uh, how about the other? Uh, how much of the stuff in the regulated market is is getting smurfed out? You know, there's. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. There's uh, a group, uh, I think they're uh, in uh, the White House Office of Drug Policy of the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Task Area, I think it's called. And they, they produce some statistics on that. Law enforcement data is, you know, they can only, they only know what they catch, right? They, they report uh, seizures and things like that, so it's very hard to really find it out. But and the other problem with that is that we are learning that a lot of people who get caught with marijuana say it's coming from Colorado, regardless of where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> right. right there. 
Right. Their current health is. And the other issue we have is the TSA at the airport tends to let small amounts go through. There, there's pretty much non-enforcement at the airport, so the small amounts versus large trafficking is just kind of going unreported, um, yeah, undeterred. <laughs> So that, that's all, that ends the data, but uh, you know, here's, here's some, uh, just some summary on, on where we're seeing things going, but you know, I, I'd like to sort of bring this back to the bundles of outcomes. You know, I think that's the best way for me that I've reconciled to think about this is, you know, so we have, we've, we've decided to uh, legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana, and we, we're going to see prevalence go up. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's part of the legalization bundle. You're going to see incarceration rates and those kinds of law enforcement costs go down. As we heard yesterday, which was one of the more surprising things I heard when uh, John Calkins added up all the costs of incarceration, um, you know, I thought that would be higher. But uh, you know, it was uh, that, that's what you trade off. I mean, you, that, that's the cost that you trade off with legalization that I think is an important part of the bundle. Uh, and the comparison should really be about legalization versus prohibition. What you know, what are the costs on either side? And it's. It's always going to be a collection of, you know, uh, vaguely related indicators that no one will ever really be able to tie down and say yes or no. So, so there you have it. Right. That's our version of an answer. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open up for questions in a minute, but I'm going to take advantage of Mike because I have it. Can we pass card time? Can we pass card time for questions? I don't know if we have cards, but okay. Um, one of the things we kind of discussed that we didn't touch yet is um, Keith and Andrew, if you guys could kind of talk about the difference between regulation from the city's point of view versus the state's point of view and the interplay in those dynamics. And then the second question, if you could both address is, Colorado and Washington um, both had medical first and, and then rec, and handled that differently. But I think you could say about California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado, we kind of had industry even before we had medical, where in the other states you see regulated systems first. And so what would your advice be to states that have the opportunity to regulate medical first that kind of anticipate a transition to recreational? Great, great questions. So um, starting on the state versus city, uh, we have very close relationships with our cities on this one. Um, for the most part, it's because the federal government is missing, and so um, we have to do a lot more on the ground level stuff that oftentimes federal government would be doing. Um, and so the partnership that normally is city, state, federal is now just state and city. Uh, that. That means that I'm talking to my counterpoints in, in Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo every day. Um, and, and there's a lot of information being passed back, back and forth. Um, we're also a local control state, and so uh, everything that you want to decide in time, place, and manner on the city side, you're allowed to decide. Uh, and uh, the state doesn't weigh in on whether or not you should or should not legalize recreational uh, versus, uh, versus medical or both or neither. Um, uh, so the you know I would say that there's really nothing but goodwill between state and city on this one, and um, and the most that we work together is things like pesticides. Where like, nobody has any idea what to do. Maybe we can use some of your public health power, some of our pesticide applicators act power, and let's see the, the, how much we can make this through uh, this together. Um, we all feel like we're we're kind of been thrown into this together. Um, for lessons for people who have medical right now, I mean, for me right now, my big thing is watch your unlicensed market. And um, it's not something you can get in control of later on. Um, and so I'm not saying that there's zero for uh, being allowed to grow at home or being allowed to, to grow. But the state needs to understand what's going on. It needs to be able to wrap its hands around how big and where it's going. Um, and so there should be an, an amount of registration and licensing it's a hard thing to do because a lot of these people um, will show up at the Capitol every time you do this and will come with uh, kids with cancer and say that you're about to price them out of everything that they can possibly do there. Uh, and the people who don't show up are the cartels who are, who are operating with uh, immunity. Um, and, uh, and you do get 
you know, policemen in there saying this is what's going on on the ground floor, but they sound a lot like the policemen who sound like Green for Madness for a long time. And so their message doesn't really get through to the legislature in the same way that uh, a kid with cancer's message gets through to the legislature. So if, if you're starting from whole cloth, what I've been telling places like Vermont is start with uh, a moratorium on unlicensed growth. Um, you can come back and evaluate later, but you have to give your license system a chance uh, to, to work like you're, you're asking it to work. Um, I also say things like you should get your public, we, we waited for a lot of money to come in to pay for some of the things we needed marijuana to pay for. I say take a, take a loan from your general fund and pay it back later. And so that is get your license system up and running. Uh, get as much enforcement power as you need on your, in your regulators. Um, get a public education campaign up and running, both a responsible youth campaign and, and a youth prevention campaign. Set those tones early, um, and then pay them back with uh, with funds that come that that come in. Um, I have a whole host of these things, uh, and um, uh, and then start data. Start data right away. You know, we a lot of the things that I think we wish we had data benchmarks on. It's too late once you've actually gone down some of these roads to come back again and. Uh, sparse out, you know, for instance, we don't do marijuana uh, suspensions in Colorado, we do drug suspensions. And so, uh, if you know, it's a pretty easy code change that if you start it right now, you'll know much faster what's going on inside your schools uh, the second you do legalize, either for medical or recreational. And so, I would think through what data sources are important to you ahead of time, and that way you have some benchmark data. I agree with everything you said, Andrew, and would add that uh, as far as the city of Seattle and the state of Washington, our Liquor and Cannabis Board, it truly, I, I view it as a partnership. In fact, I've said repeatedly that uh, they deserve the uh, Agency of the, of the Century Award for essentially designing a regulatory system uh, from the ground up, uh, designing the airplane while you're flying it. And uh, there have been lots and lots of challenges. Um, I think. You know, ideally, you want. Oh, I guess one footnote to that is there's still the need for uh, more cooperation across the board. Uh, recently, in Seattle, uh, delivery services, which are not yet legal under state law, but which the mayor and I, for instance, support, and we uh, introduced amendments in the legislature this year that didn't make it that asked for the right to license and regulate delivery services in the city of Seattle, um, and. Uh, until we get that, that uh, authority, however, it is outside the uh, 502 uh, safe harbor, if you will, and consequently it's nothing in the world but a felony distribution of controlled substance. Um, and so when we busted eight uh, that were advertising uh, and our county prosecutor just declined to file anything, um, and even though these are plain blatant felonies, uh, it sends an interesting message, uh, especially when he said it was confusing. And I'm not sure what's confusing about did they deliver marijuana, did they have a license, and you know that's how straightforward it is. Um, so we've got a, a little bit to work on there, but it really has been a great state and city partnership, despite the fact, by the way, that our current governor and our current attorney, attorney general, both progressive Democrats that came into office the same ballot as 502 passing, both opposed 502. Uh, so uh, it's it's been a it's been a, a interesting uh, evolution. Uh, some of the things that have happened, we don't have all of the stores that were allotted that are open. Um, another little humorous footnote: the Seattle Times several years ago ran a headline after I wrote to our liquor and cannabis board saying that uh, we need more uh, licenses in the city of Seattle. And the headline was: City Attorney says Seattle needs more pot shops. And uh, it was uh, one of those moments where um, I think of all the hundreds of comments that followed the, the last one saying, I waited all my life to read a headline like that. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, we have to have an adequate supply to meet demand if you really want to shift it to uh, the licensed regulated market. And uh, one of the things that we're working with the board on is the fact that there are a number of licenses that are out there that have where the, the holders are essentially sitting on it. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't opened them, and yet we're, we're up against the cap. While other cities that have established lower caps, unlike Seattle wants more, other cities want less, they have more licensees approved than the cities would, would allow. 
So we've got to work that out. But at the same time, I understand that there are problems in the city of Seattle with some of these licensees finding locations that will meet uh, meet the restrictions under 502. So we clearly have to work with them. And Seattle has been very aggressive in going forward with zoning, with uh, a new uh, title to our Seattle Municipal Code for licensing. And uh, all of those we're trying to coordinate closely with uh, the Liquor and Cannabis Board, as well as going back uh, every year to the uh, state legislature for, for new improvements. It's a political question, uh, Jill, uh, that whether you go with uh, medical, you, you absolutely, if you're um, a, a state that has not had any kind of uh, legal marijuana, uh, it, it is uh, plainly best from the, the, the wonky lawyer regulator standpoint, do it all at once, please God, please do it all at once, because it is really, really tough I think, you know, Colorado would, like Andrew would probably say, it's going to be really tough to put that homegrown genie back in the bottle. Um, we're fortunate in Washington that 502 did not include homegrowns. The only way you could grow at home in the state of Washington was if you were an authorized medical user. Um, that is still not uh, allowed in Washington. I personally support very limited homegrowns because, again, as the, as the prosecutor slash regulator, whatever, all I need is some clear distinction between what is a commercial operation and what is a small personal use home grow. I want it to be really, really simple for the cop in the field. And then you get to ask that same question. Do you have a license? So, you know, the delivery guy that had four and a half pounds of pot in his car and, and a couple of crack samples while, while you're at it, um, and doesn't have a state license, we know we can get him the large grow in the basement uh, we know that we can we can uh, effectively deter that category as a competitor to the license regulated system. Uh, that's what we need is clarity on that. Um, the problem is we never would have gotten here, and this is the last philosophical point I'll close on. Uh, look, prohibition is just wrong. I think you've got to keep coming back to that. And at the same time, where you have you have folks that um, will say, I think the numbers are more than half of Americans think that. Marijuana should be legalized, or it's inevitable to be legalized. But it's in the 80s and 90s of that there is medical uh, medical justification for, for marijuana for a limited, far more limited circumstances than actually are driving the market. But still, it's that that wide public acceptance uh, that has enabled uh, what is a lot of recreational use to go forward. It's too bad because I think in a lot of ways it it uh, dilutes the truly. Uh, uh, needed and, and uh, important medical uses of marijuana, but it is a fact of life. So design it from the outset if you can do that politically. I just don't see most politicians doing that. Maybe it'll change in the next few years, but um, it was easy to get medical through relatively, um, and then you're just left though with the problem, how do you integrate the two, uh, adult use and medical? Okay, I think we're, um, this one is actually probably for you as well. Uh, there's another market, which is physicians providing authorizations to patients. Um, how is this being handled in Colorado, Washington, and, and regulated? Yeah, so we use the caregiver re or the the patient registry um, to focus on uh, doctors who are giving out a lot of extended plan counts, um, and also doctors who don't seem to have uh, any uh, overlap with uh, the. The things they're prescribing for, right? So if you're an OBGYN and you're you're giving it to a 15 year old male for back pain, um, that that seems to be something that should go to the medical board and and be reviewed. Um, the medical board is a slow process, and um, and the enforcement really started in earnest about two years ago. Um, so we we have seen a couple dozen cases start to go through, um, and maybe that will help, especially with hey, listen, you. We will evaluate why you're giving 99 plant counts um, kind of over and over and over again. Um, and, uh, and we'll see where that goes. Um, it's not a fix all for it. Um, and, um, you know, a uh, doctor's lawyer up really quick when, when you're, when you're going to take away their medical license. And so um, those, those things will take five, ten years for enforcement to go through that way. A shorter answer is I don't know. Um, July 1st is when our uh, combination under state law of medical and recreational takes effect. Uh, to, get, to get a medical uh, authorization, 
Um, you have to register with the state system under the new law, which is definitely going to uh, chill a lot of participation. And then the benefits that you get from it, besides being able to grow at home, uh, is that you, um, you, you get uh, relief from the sales tax, 10% 10, 10 sales tax. You still, the 30% excise tax, is still, you're still going to be paying it. So I'm not sure that there's going to be a lot of participation. Uh, we have members of the Liquor Council Board here to give you an idea better than I about how many retailers are actually seeking a medical endorsement to their 502 <coughs> license to, so that they can sell. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the outcome is going to be. And just to add to that really quickly, a lot of this is made harder because there are no standards about what are what is medical necessity, what is so to actually come through and prosecute these cases and draw bright lines in a place without the science behind it is, is really difficult. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, this one I like. Uh, who handles antitrust issues, for example, mergers? And I would add to that kind of regulating the advertising restrictions we have in the state. So who's responsible for that enforcement? So mergers, uh, it, I mean, to the extent to which that sort of thing happens in the industry will look like change of ownership to us. Uh, and so that's the Department of Revenue, um, which is an interesting problem uh, because they'll be the first to say that they are not financial experts. Uh, and so uh, putting them into difficult financial uh, systems and you know uh, however however complicated you get with the, what ultimately could be a straw man owner um, is it has become something that they've hired up some expertise on but it's really hard for them to get there um, and advertising also uh, we can take a license violation against you but we also are you know um, hope, trying to get local law enforcement to hold it against uh, the advertisers themselves uh, for uh, allowing for something that doesn't meet what's called our 30-70 rule, which is that 30% of uh, your audience has to be under, has to be, less than 30% of your audience has to be under the age of 21. Um, uh, I think I said that right in the end. Um, unfortunately, medical's not aligned yet, and so a lot of these people are pushing it through medical anyway. We're trying to align it as we speak, and honestly, I don't think the 30-70 rule is good enough anyway, uh, and um, and it's frankly not as enforced as it should be. So uh, it is a place where I think we are we are definitely falling short um, and could could do a lot better on. Uh, and it's going to be a place that's that's going to be really hard to catch up on. Can I make a quick remark on that? Uh, <clears throat> we are seeing, and I, I see it anecdotally, uh, a lot of uh, consolidation in Colorado to probably about a handful, four to six. Only the state enforcing. Uh, the ownership rules, uh, and uh, uh, but as far as the advertising, it, it is an example where there there are state standards, but it's probably the local zoning and sign laws that will impact. We have a great example. The highest grossing retailer in the state of Washington is in Seattle, and uh, while in, in compliance with all of the signage requirements, both state and local, is uh, also owns the glass goods store right next door to it, where he sells all the paraphernalia, and that is lit up in neon and uh, it's quite bright and it actually has helped probably drive crime down on this block because it's so well lit now but, but the notion that there were actually signage requirements that would shock most people when they drive by this place because it looks like I mean it's the same owner uh, but it, it, anyway it's one of those uh, gosh I guess we didn't think this through all the way. Following up about the supply chain, like producers who grow it and sell it, is there any regulation on the vertical integration of the industry? Uh, in, in Washington, I'm so, yeah, uh, we do have you know producer, processor, retailer, and I think there's a three license limit for any one uh, any one any one entity holding those. Uh, we only allow uh, producer processors to be combined in a single license, but uh, but the retailers have to be separate from from the up, up part of the chain, the processors and producers. And it's the opposite, the opposite. But it's different in Colorado. In Colorado, because of our history of the Amendment 20 and the dispensary system that came from that, uh, the state required the medical dispensaries to grow about 70% or so, maybe 80, of what they sold. And it was a matter of, of trying to control and trying to monitor the market. They have more accountability, they thought, at that time. And now, since the way that recreational has evolved, we've, what we've done is we, we first just ported the medical model into regulation. So you see a lot of vertically integrated operators in Colorado 
But what the state has then done, uh, probably in, I want to say like November of 2014 or so, they uh, uh, we called it smashing vertical integration. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 But they uh, yeah they, they don't require vertical integration anymore. But those we smashed it with those those that, <laughs> those that were tried to resist the smashing I guess to the best of their ability. And you see it different across the country. So Can you speak to some of the documents though that you require in that uh, supply chain. Oh. So you see the, the vertical integration versus the horizontal different throughout the country. So as new states come online, everyone handles it differently. And you see a mix across the board, so you don't see one pattern being followed. So it's either multiple license streams or forced vertical. Um, and sometimes there's restrictions. Washington's probably one of the only where you can't have a producer, processor, retail, but like in Illinois you can't hold all of the licenses, but they're all separate licenses. So you see that very different. And then, I'm sorry, did you want to? I, I was just to, to tack on what kind of documents are in that uh, vertical or non-vertical situation so you know, that you have a supply chain. So uh, it's, it's important to go through, and I guess I always thought people didn't know this, and then of course they don't know this. Every single marijuana plant in the recreational and medical license system has a radio frequency identifier tag on it. Um, and uh, through the entire seed to sale tracking system. This is, again, the other minor miracle is that this actually works. Um, much of the pain of industry, and the industry complains bitterly about it, but um, you have to tell us at every moment exactly where all your marijuana is, and we can come in and wave this wand around, and if, if you tell us there's 80 plants and we only see 70 plants in there, we're gonna ask you what happened to the other 10 plants, and you also have to videotape every single corner of the grow. And so if you say they burned down, say, well, show us that they burned down. Um, and, uh, and so it's a very heavily documented system. And then as you transport it, you have to have a manifest of here going from point A to point B. And this is the road you're going to be using at this time. And it's going to be these plants with these tag numbers on them. Most of our uh, regulators at the Marijuana Enforcement Division are former gambling regulators. And so you have a lot of video surveillance in the Colorado system, and you have a lot of accounting of and counting your chips and your plants is involved. That's how the system has worked. And I would argue that's one of the reasons we haven't seen more crime in dispensaries is the very heavy right. security requirements in every state, and seed to sale is consistent from every state. That was a Colorado term that started that has just been prevalent. And it's it's everywhere now. So every state has seed to sale tracking, whether or not RFID. Um, you know, it remains to be seen. But we see more and more states actually contracting with point of sale contractors themselves um, to mandate a system. Now, when it comes to API and functionality, that's all. I've been told that's a thing. We don't go there. Um, Andrew, you mentioned that cartels have a visible presence in, in Colorado. What form does that take, and what is the state doing um, about that? So, uh, um, well, there was actually just a bust, uh, man, it must have been five days ago, uh, of a number of home grows uh, that were, um, and, and, this, and these are ongoing police actions, so there's only so much that I know uh, that, that can be shared, but it appears to be um, a, a very specific Cuban cartel that has uh, found a system in Colorado that they've educated each other on and moved and used this as a, uh, a front for their activities. Um, it appears that what they do is go and get 99 plant counts, um, come in, grow, grow it in their basement, they have about five houses on the block, and then they all work together, and then they ship it out in FedEx boxes or uh, drive it out of state. Again, only at the point where it's in the box and heading out, or they drive they drive across state boundaries, have they ever committed a crime at that uh, at that point. Um, but it's uh, you know as our DEA is going through it, it's just the same case over and over and over again. Um, and uh, it's you know you have 99 plants for back pain, and you're going to create edibles, and when you go into those places, there's no edibles. And, the person will openly admits what's going on. Um, we are doing a couple of things. We, you know, we are required to register in order to be a caregiver in Colorado, but there's no penalty if you don't. And so, starting January 1st of 2017, we'll have a, an up-to-date system that um, you are not a caregiver until you register, uh, and, and you're an only a caregiver for the number of plants in that system, and it's immediately. Uh, pingable by our uh, law enforcement so that they can come in, they can say how many is this person supposed to have, is that the amount that they have because of what you find a lot is also 
you've been given 16 plants you're allowed to grow, and you're growing 100 plants, um, and it's just confusing enough for law enforcement that they, they leave it be. It's not a perfect fix because, again, a lot of these people are allowed to grow the number of plants that they're growing, um, but it's our first attempt to try to, try to wrap our hands around um, kind of how our, with how our hands are tied already through Amendment 20, which has a lot of privacy rights built in for caregivers. Um, have Colorado and Washington been interacting with the federal government on any of these issues? issues, banking, um, enforcement, and, and what is the relationship there? So we talked to Washington once a month on the phone. Um, uh, Sandy, who's here somewhere, maybe not in this one, but uh, yeah, uh, we, have a, we have a monthly phone call. Everything that we think we can leverage with each other, I think Oregon has now joined the phone call, and I, I think we'll continue to grow that group to whoever really wants to be on that phone call. Uh, we've written a number of letters to uh, to uh, the Obama administration and to Congress together, we will co-sign on anything about banking in particular, but also pesticides. Uh, I think it's a, a good working relationship that will leverage as much as possible. Yeah, my contacts are more direct. Uh, I said just this past week I had a meeting with the U.S. Attorney in Washington, and uh, again, they're concerned about some of the inquiries that are coming down the chain from DOJ. So they're very much interested in what we're doing locally as well as what the state's doing. Um, uh, you know, stay tuned. But I, I do make her nervous when I talk about, I want some of my visions going forward. So I want to see marijuana tourism uh, be permitted, facilitated going forward, especially in Seattle. Um, and uh, that in turn is going to deal with issues that we touched on in some of the other sessions about vaporization. I think uh, it even goes back neatly to my philosophy about, you know, when government acts without authority, uh, you know, it undermines the legitimacy of law enforcement. And that's one area where, you know, there's no proof of secondhand impacts of, uh, of vaporization like, um, like there is with, uh, with actual combustible products and, and smoking. And so I, I think that you, you can also facilitate areas where public uh, consumption can be done, where, where private lounges where consumption can be done, but using uh, the, the technology, the harm reduction technology of, of vaporizing. The feds are not quite ready to go there when I have those discussions, but it's amazing how a lot of the blue chip hotel chains are very anxious. Tell us how we can do this. And so those conversations are happening. Um, and uh, I do envision where you can come and enjoy Washington wines and, and cannabis, uh, but you know, using the, using the tech. Pardon me. Separately. Separately. <laughs> well, ideally. Right. Unfortunately. We